Newton says that anything that's in motion will tend to stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. So if fluids are going to do anything interesting, then we have to have forces applied to them that are going to cause them to accelerate and change their velocity. Otherwise, nothing very interesting or useful is going to happen. So the first thing to know about fluids is that fluids have mass. Everything that we work with pretty well has mass. Liquids weigh about, have a mass of about a uh, thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Now it's important that we keep track of when we're talking about mass versus weight because we're really interested in mass in kilograms, not weight in newtons. So liquids have a mass of around a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Gases at one atmosphere pressure, so the pressure that's around us right now, have a mass of around one kilogram per cubic meter. The air that we're, we're sitting in right now is probably about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So there's a difference of about 800 in the mass, the density of these fluids, which you already knew at least uh, in, in a gut feel sort of a sense. Gravitational forces apply as long as we're on the Earth and just about all the engineering that we, uh, we do will be on the Earth. And these chunks of fluid have some inertia. Because they've got mass, they have inertia. They're moving, and as a result of all the forces that have previously been applied to them, they will tend to stay in motion until we apply new forces to change that momentum because of their inertia. Now, we're mechanical engineers. We're interested mostly in fluids in motion. In civil engineering, there's a whole lot of fluid mechanics that relates to liquids primarily that aren't moving or liquids that are moving around stationary structures and flowing down rivers and so on. There's a huge body of work that's been done on open channel flow that's really important and it's not really part of what we're going to be looking at. We will, however, look at fluid statics and we'll look at some stuff that looks a fair bit like dams just to understand the behavior of the forces and, uh, and look at some of the forces in the mechanical systems that we're interested in. So a fluid, any fluid, will deform under shearing stresses. If you're trying to deform it, it is going to deform. The harder you push on it, the more it's going to deform, the more quickly it's going to deform. If the fluid's at rest, then there can't be any shearing stresses. The only stresses in a fluid at rest are the hydrostatic pressure stresses. So that's the pressure acting inwards on the surface, perpendicular to the surface, everywhere. And they, the pressure forces are isotropic. They're independent of direction. So if there's a pressure of uh, 100 kilopascals pushing in from the side, there'll also be pressure of 100 kilopascals pushing from the top and maybe a little bit more from the bottom to offset the fact that we've got gravity going on here. That, uh, that uh, a little bit higher pressure at the bottom of that control volume than at the top of that control volume. Now, when those pressure forces act on other fluid elements, they're going to be balanced one against the other, so nothing moves. The one element is pushing just as hard in the one direction as the other element is pushing back against it. Equal and opposite reactions, nothing moves. If we move to a situation where the fluid, typically a liquid, is up against a solid surface, we'll probably be interested in the forces acting on that solid surface. Now this shows a, uh, uh, a reservoir full of water. That little triangle means a, a free surface where the water me meets the air. And the pressure of that water goes up as we go deeper into the water, just like the pressure goes up as you swim down to the bottom of a swimming pool. So the pressure force acting perpendicular to the surface increases in magnitude as we go down in depth underwater. Now this diagram seems to suggest that we could take that distributed pressure force and express it as a single reaction force acting at a single point at the center of pressure. And in some instances we can get away with that, but we have to always remember that it is a distributed force. 
It's a distributed pressure over a surface area and little bits of force integrated over that whole surface area give us the overall force effect. So keep that in mind. Now I mentioned before that fluids are going to resist deformation, so if a fluid is moving, there's going to be some frictional forces in the fluid that resist that motion. So in this instance, if I've got a fixed plate at the bottom and a moving plate over top and this whole thing extends out indefinitely horizontally so I don't have any edge effects to worry about, then if I try to slide that top plate from left to right, there's going to be some resistance from the fluid. And if the fluid is really thick, really viscous, like maple syrup, uh, then it'll be harder to move than if the fluid is really thin, really low viscosity like water or even air. On an air hockey table, this is sort of what's going on when you slide that air hockey puck around. Very low friction. Imagine trying to play air hockey on a table covered in maple syrup it would be a really slow game. So that viscous friction depends on how quickly you're deforming the fluid. So it depends on the velocity gradient. So the steeper the slope in that velocity distribution, the higher the viscous shear stress that you'll feel at the wall or anywhere in the fluid. Now with these two plates, the uh, velocity gradient is the same everywhere. The velocity profile has a linear variation, so the derivative of velocity with y position is a constant. So the shear stress is the same at the bottom plate, at the top plate, and also between two little elements of fluid halfway in between. And that viscous shear stress depends on that velocity gradient. Fluid interfaces, it, where air meets water, for example, also have surface tension. You've used this effect to blow bubbles uh, in, uh, in the air. You've, uh, you've seen this effect with bubbles moving around in water or in other liquids. And bubbles or drops tend to be round. That's because the surface tension is pulling that surface to try to minimize that surface area. And the result is that the pressure is higher on the inside of curved surfaces. Now, surface tension forces only get to be significant either when all the other forces are really small or when the curvature is really strong. Because the smaller the particle, the smaller the radius of curvature, the tighter the bend, the bigger that pressure effect of that surface tension is. So we'll look at a few flows that, uh, that have surface tension, but for most of the course, we'll be ignoring surface tension. Now, fluid elements. You can think of a fluid element inside of a fluid. Uh, it's a control volume that doesn't have any real surfaces, but imagine a tetra brick like this, uh, this box of Minute Maid. And those boundaries you can see, but we could just as easily project imaginary boundaries like that into our fluid. Likewise, if we make our fluid elements really small, very tiny control volumes, we can do exactly the same kind of analysis on a much smaller fluid element. And again, we just have to imagine that the surfaces are there. Uh, and then we can do the analysis on how one little element of fluid is affecting the others. So if we look at the forces acting on a fluid element, either surrounded by other fluid elements or at a boundary between the fluid and the solid, we can do a force balance and figure out how much that fluid is going to accelerate. So in class we'll talk about some of these forces but think, think about this instance of this particular fluid element which happens to be resting on this desk. What forces are important? The ones you may have come up with uh, would include viscous friction, because we just talked about viscous friction. How hard does the fluid resist deformation? The pull from the surfaces, uh, like, like the plates, or from other fluid elements around it, 
will cause the fluid to accelerate or decelerate by viscous effects, the interaction at the surfaces. Pressure forces also act at the surfaces, but they have nothing to do with the viscosity. They're just how hard the surroundings are pushing in on the fluid. And pressure forces uh, will cause acceleration or deceleration, and they'll behave the same way whether we have a high viscosity fluid or a low viscosity fluid. So pressure forces are almost always going to be really important. Inertia. Inertia isn't really a force, but we will talk about inertial forces. Because if a fluid's already moving, the fact of that motion means that we'd have to use some kind of a force to change that motion. So inertial forces, we're asking the question, how hard would we have to push to stop the fluid or change its direction? How much force is represented by the velocity of this fluid as it's moving, excuse me, moving past us? Um, gravity. Gravity acts everywhere on Earth. We're going to have to keep track of gravity. And finally, surface tension. Does the surface interface cause the fluid to behave in any way that uh, can't be accounted for by these other four forces? Usually this will happen only when things are small. Uh, but it can also happen uh, in situations where all the other forces are small. The fluid will creep around due to the surface tension. So every time you sit down to look at a particular fluid mechanical problem, keep track of the forces that are acting in the problem because this fluid mechanics stuff is all about F equals MA. So figure out which forces are important Viscous forces, pressure forces, is it inertia, gravity, surface tension forces, which ones are big and which ones are small, and that will help you figure out where you're going to go with your analysis. Because in just about everything we do, it's going to come down to F equals MA. How is the velocity of the fluid changing because of the environment that it's in?